Hi, and welcome to Legal Cut Pro, the Canadian entertainment law podcast. My name is Greg Pang. And I'm Michelle Molyneux. And today's podcast is about how to drone, an interview with drone expert and drone pilot, Matt Matthews. But first, a shout out to our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Ampia and its professional development team. Special thanks to Jane Toogood, our audio editor. You can find her online on Instagram at JJ underscore Toogood. You know what else is awesome, Michelle? Hmm. The Canadian Film Centre, based in Toronto. The Canadian Film Centre, yes, they are, uh, I guess, another sponsor of this podcast. The CFC, not to be confused with the Calgary Film Centre, is a leading not-for-profit cultural organization for the development and advancement of Canadian creative entrepreneurial talent in the screen-based industries. Awesome. CFC's program and initiatives span film and television, screen acting, composing, and songwriting for the screen and digital media and immersive media. For instance, there is the 2020 Cineplex Film Program, which is open for applications now, and the deadline is January 13, 2020, 5 p.m. Eastern. Visit cfccreates.com for more information and to apply. That's cfccreates.com. Awesome. I'm totally going to check that out. (laughs) Perfect. And now we will talk about today's podcast. Yeah. So today we have a very special guest on the pod. Big welcome to Matt Matthews. Hey, guys. How are you? Good, good. How about yourself? I am fantastic. Thanks for asking. So Matt is the owner of Black Hawk Aeronautical, which is based out of Edmonton, and he is a drone wizard. That's quite, is that your official title, Matt? Drone wizard? (laughs) Well, I I think a lot of people take this one take wonder, right? But no, um, yeah, no, I'm a a professional drone operator here in uh, the city of Edmonton. Awesome. Um, So, so many questions for you, Matt. But first one is, how did you get started out in the drone industry? Well, it's, I think it's a combination of a couple of my professions and my passions. Um, I've got a, a background in aviation, uh, a background in safety. Uh, I've been a hobby photographer, videographer for quite some time. And of course, I've always enjoyed radio controls. So, you know, when you look at 10 years ago, when these actually started to become mainstream, um, I took a huge interest in it. And, you know, as, as luck may have it, with all of these passions and professions, they combined into what I managed to turn into a career as a, a professional drone operator. Well, that's fantastic. And what, what kind of services uh, do you offer as part of your business? Uh, well, you know, unlike a lot of drone operators that are out there that are typically offering like just photography or just video, uh, I've always wanted to remain a bit of a generalist. So I'm, uh, you know, not only do I offer aerial photography services as well as, well as aerial video, um, I get into things like surveying, I get into search and rescue, uh, I've done some minor and major motion pictures. Um, you know, there's, I, I've, I've really kept it open so that I could, uh, you know, kind of immerse myself in the drone industry. Um, you know, aerial inspections is a big one as well. Um, so yeah, quite, quite a variety of different services um, all pertaining to the operation of a drone. That's awesome. It sounds like every day must be unique and different. Well, you know, I don't look at it as a job anymore. It's it's something that I just love to do. And it's, hey, you know, it's nice when you get a paycheck. But uh, absolutely, <laughs> um, you know, the, it, there's always something that's different. And that's what I love about this particular career is, you know, it's not the day-to-day monotonous, uh, you know, type profession. There's always a new request, you know, something crazy, travel somewhere or film this or film that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm been doing it long enough now that my name is out there. So it's, yeah, it's it just always, always evolving. And it's just something that I love. That's the best. Um, so I understand that you, you share your passion for drones uh, in one way by teaching courses. So what exactly do you teach in these courses? So Transport Canada has come out with some new legislation and uh, part of that legislation requires folks to either become a basic or an advanced operator. Um, Now I offer a ground school class that basically uh, allows individuals to prepare for the Transport Canada exam. Um, It's not necessarily a requirement, Uh, however there are standards that have been outlined for uh, my company as a uh, as a drone training provider, and uh, we basically follow those standards and deliver all the materials so that folks can basically prepare uh, to write the online exam. Well, perfect. And speaking of the uh, new Transport Canada uh, regulations that just uh, came into force this past June, what do you think about them? In our last episode, we provided a, a resume or, or a summary of 
those regulations. But as a drone operator, uh, what's, uh, I guess, how do you feel about uh, these, uh, these licensing requirements and all, all these rules? Do you think they're draconian or do you think they make sense? Um, do, they think, do you think they serve a safety purpose? Stuff like that. Well, haven't haven't been in this industry for quite a long time. I've I've really seen a big um, evolution of how the Canadian drone regulations have come to play. Um, so you know, it, it's always a good thing. Um, you know, with the new regulations that have come out, this is probably about the fourth or fifth time that I've seen changes since I've been in this industry. Um, I, I've always said that it's it's a good thing. Um, you know, it shows us that the government is paying attention, um, you know, and they're, they're modifying their rules and regulations to adjust for the technology because the technology is, we're, we're moving at, at a light speed and, you know, every time you turn around, there's something that's new that's come out. Drones can fly faster, drones can fly farther, the cameras are better. Um, you know, so we want to make sure that uh, we stay on top of that. So I, I, I definitely support it. Um, you know, as with all regulations that come out, um, there's always a few things that you disagree with. Um, but at the same token, too, you do have to appreciate the amount of work that's gone into, um, you know, developing the new regulations. Um, you know, that said, I, I think for individuals that that truly want to do this as a as a commercial operator and, and make a profession out of it, I think the regulations are very, very good. Uh, for those individuals that are trying to kind of break ground and get into the industry, um, it can become very challenging. I'm not going to say that it's bad, but it's definitely challenging. Um, and in some cases, it's very overwhelming for a new operator to, you know, oh, my God, there's all these new rules. Um, you know, I, like I said, I, I do think that we've seen some huge improvement, um, but it can be very challenging for somebody that's just getting into the industry. I know Makes I sense. definitely was a little bit overwhelmed when I was trying to read and learn about the rules <laughs> prepping for our last episode. Um, so maybe let's actually get into some of those kind of practical aspects of the drone rules in Canada. Uh, to start off, how does one register a drone? Uh, well, you know, the, the good news is the process is relatively straightforward. Uh, Transport Canada maintains uh, a website dedicated specifically to drone operations. So for anybody that wants to register a drone, in fact, actually, it's, it's a requirement for any drone that's greater than 250 grams uh, that you do have to register. it. So you can just search uh, Transport Canada Drone Safety and you'll end up landing on this one page that offers a, a whole bunch of information for for basic and advanced operators, and then also obviously the one of the uh, one of the links that you can click is to register your drones. So by clicking on that link, you can create an account, um, and with that account, then you log in. Uh, you would identify the type of drone that you're registering, and then uh, after a five dollar payment is made, uh, they will send you your certificate right then and there. Um, and then of course that certificate has your registration number that you would then place on the drone. Hmm. Interesting. And uh, well, with respect to the, uh, the the certification, the pilot certification, yep. is it uh, is it difficult to get that? Uh, I know the the regulations state you know you must get it depending on what you're doing. You get the uh, like you mentioned the basic or the advanced certificate. Um, but uh, what's uh, I guess uh, uh, how difficult is it to get those certificates? Well well, let's talk about the basic exam right now. So first of all, both exams cost $10. So that's, it's a relatively inexpensive. Um, the other thing is, is it's, uh, you can rewrite it as many times as you need uh, until you finally pass it. So now with the basic exam, uh, there's 35 questions. Uh, Transport Canada offers you an hour and a half time to write it and the pass mark is 65%. So you do have quite a bit of time to go through um, answer all the questions that you feel that you'd be able to answer right away. Um, and then once you've, you know, kind of plowed through those ones, then you can take the remaining time and, and search for most of the answers, which are most of them, you know, are available online. Uh, once you have the basic exam uh, complete and passed, uh, that would qualify you for your, you know, your basic operations, which, you know, permits you to do a couple of things with the exception of flying near airports or in controlled airspace or, or near people. Um, the second exam, of course, is the, the advanced exam. That also is only $10. That also you can write it uh, as many times as required. Um, it is a little bit more challenging, though, because the exam is only 60 minutes. Um, there's 50 questions, and the pass mark's 80%. Um, I know when I deliver my ground school class, uh, one of the things that I tell all my students, I'll say, good news, guys, uh, the exam is only $10 to, to write. 
the the not so good news is is budget yourself fifty to sixty dollars because typically <laughs> that's how many times it takes an individual before they're successful, you know, in passing the class or passing oh, really? the exam. Yeah, it is it is quite challenging. Um, I have had some people get very lucky and pass it without a ground school. But most people that uh, that have you know will challenge it will go oh man there's way too much information here that I don't know and I can't I can't search it fast enough so that's where the the ground school class will come into play to to obviously provide them with that information to prepare for the advanced exam. Hmm. Are the questions multiple choice or are they long answer? There, all the questions are multiple choice. So there's no long answer. There's no fill in the blank. You basically you'll have a question and you'll be given up to four answers that uh, obviously it's choose the best or correct answer for that, for that question. Okay. I like multiple choice exams. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit of a nerd that way. There you go. <laughs> so uh, kind of a, a random question about drones is, what if someone wants to fly them indoors? Do you still need to register and get certified? Well, that's that's a that's a great question because let's kind of talk about how that's evolved. Um, in the old regulations, you actually had to maintain something called a special flight operation certificate. Uh, in short, we called it an SFOC, and uh, and and with that, uh, the old Canadian aviation regulations actually stipulated that you had to have netting up and you had to, you know, be a certain distance for people and, um, you know, you had to maintain this special certification. Uh, after June 1st, with the new regulations that came out, they've actually completely omitted that section. So, the, 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 giving you the long answer, the short answer is there's actually no regulations pertaining to operating a drone indoors anymore. Um, it's basically, it would be between you and the building owner. Uh, which obviously at that point in time, you want to make sure that if you're doing anything from a commercial perspective, um, that you've taken all necessarily safety measures to prevent, you know, an incident from occurring. And of course, um, you know, I would obviously recommend insurance as well. Hmm. That's very interesting. And that would, uh, for the purposes of this podcast, that would engage uh, another law, occupier's liability for potential uh, injury or damage. Um, because some of these drones, I take it can get pretty, they can be pretty big. And if those blades hit flesh at full speed, they can do some damage, I take it. You're, yeah, you're talking close to a thousand RPM per, per <laughs> light. So, and right. then some of them are constructed out of a, a, you know, a high density plastic. And in some cases, some are even carbon fiber. So absolutely, um, you know, flesh and propellers certainly do not mix. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> I'm seeing um, for our listeners who are filmmakers, I think somebody needs to make a, a horror film about like an, a, an attacking drone. It's funny you mentioned that. If you actually search IMDb, you will see a movie called The Drone and it is available on Netflix for purchase. It's <laughs> the cheesiest thing I've ever seen, but somebody actually took the time to make one. I'm going to watch it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I have a question, Matt. Um, about uh, your work for uh, for filmmakers um, and, and getting footage, uh, aerial footage, either outdoors or indoors, uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience? Because this podcast, of course, is targeted towards uh, film producers. So uh, let us know what you've done for in, in the film space. Absolutely. Um, you know, aside from doing uh, a lot of marketing projects for different companies, um, you know, some of the basic stuff that I've been, been involved with is working with various real estate agencies and property development companies that want to showcase either a neighborhood or a, um, uh, you know, or a, a larger property, smaller property or commercial, whatever the case may be. Um, in terms of some of the, the more, I guess, recognized projects, uh, I do a lot of work with the uh, Oilers Entertainment uh, Group. And uh, we, uh, I provide them with the aerial footage for a lot of their promotional work. Uh, but uh, what you'll see more often is actually all of the, the exterior drone shots of Rogers Place that they will cut into their production. Uh, as part of the hockey games, I've, uh, I've done all of those shots for them. Um, I just uh, actually in February, I ended up going to China, which would probably have been my greatest trip that I've done so far. Um, I was working with uh, a production crew, basically uh, documenting a um, an ice climber. So uh, a Canadian ice climber uh, out of Canmore, his name is Will Gad. 
um, ended up uh, meeting up with a gentleman who idolized Will from China, uh, who is also one of the best ice climbers in China. So the two of them got together, uh, and our film crew went and basically followed them around as they did some, you know, unbelievable rock climbing as well as some, uh, you know, pretty pretty amazing ice climbing as well. So those are some of the big projects that I've been involved with recently. That sounds incredible. Wow. <laughs> it, it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, probably one of the greatest work trips I've ever been on. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, sounds amazing, yeah. Yeah, I never would have thought that that the drone industry could take you around the world. That's really cool. Well, you know, and it was interesting. It was just a you know a, a series of luck, um, you know, and being in the right place in the right time. Um, you know, there was a, a dedicated drone operator that was going to go with this crew. Um, you know, obviously with uh, the tension between Canada and China at the time. Uh, the drone a operator that was part of the project decided to pull out. And so I was kind of a last minute call up. I uh, was able to get my work visa done in place. And then uh, before you knew it, I was on a plane to Beijing. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> um, have there been any horror stories from the industry? Um, you know, we I, I kind of keep my, I guess, my ear to the ground to, to hear what's happening around, um, you know, in the drone industry across Canada. There hasn't been really anything major that's occurred. Now, as for myself, um, you know, I've, I've had a couple of, you know, I would say potentially serious run-ins um, over the years. Probably the worst that I had is I was with a, a work colleague and we were traveling, um, you know, towards Winnipeg to do some uh, ground school training. And um, we decided to stop and do some flying um, uh, just slightly east of Cyprus there, uh, you know, not, not in the national park, but east of the park there where they have a lot of wind turbines. And we wanted to capture some really nice footage of the turbines, but of course, make sure that it was done safely and at the time done in accordance with uh, with our license that we had. Um, and fortunately, I, I think there was an individual that was nearby that uh, didn't like drones, didn't take to drones too well. And uh, myself and my colleague found ourselves staring at a shotgun. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So, well, that's he, awful. Uh, he, uh, he came out of his farm and jumped out of his truck with a gun in his hand. And we were, you know, we were mortified. We didn't know what to do. And, you know, his issue at the time is, is he thought that we were spying on his farm. Um, when in reality, we were, weren't looking anywhere near that direction. We were trying to film the, uh, the wind turbine. So we managed to, you know, diffuse the situation, gave him an opportunity to look at the footage um, and then, uh, you know, when everything was said and done, we packed our stuff up and left. Uh, that unfortunately wasn't the end of it because uh, about a week later, we ended up receiving a, a call from the Swift Current RCMP inquiring about it. And, uh, you know, we answered a couple of questions. We told them where we were at. We showed, we actually showed them the flight log of where we were. And then I brought up the point and I'm like, oh, did the guy actually mention that he had a gun? And the officers were, uh, no. <laughs> they said, wow. would, you, would you like us to proceed with that? And I said, well, I'll tell you what, if, if he is persistent on the fact that we uh, were flying too close to his property, um, you know, we'll bring up the gun issue. And unfortunately for me, that was the last time that we've ever, uh, that, uh, that I ever heard of that. But yeah, that was probably the scariest one that I've had so far. Wow. Wow. wow I'm glad you're okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So is my family. Yeah. Yeah. That's not something you would expect to have happen. No, not at all. Wow. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm just trying to think, I think those are all my questions, Greg. Did you have anything else? For yeah, today? just a couple more, Matt. Um, sure. With respect to, again, your, uh, your work for, uh, in film and television, if uh, someone uh, were to say that, oh, I, I need some, uh, you know, footage, I would like some aerial footage of this uh, location um, or this uh, landscape or something like that, then they can hire you for that kind of work? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I get those kind of requests quite often. Um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, as you talked about it already, safety is definitely the, the biggest priority for me. So, you know, when a client does request uh, aerial footage, one of the first things that I come back with them say, where do you need it done? Uh, because that's really going to dictate the amount of work that I have to do ahead of time before we can fly. So as an example, um, you know, if we're operating within controlled airspace, so we're near an airport, um, not necessarily 
filming the airport, but it just so happens that there's there's a certain envelope of, of controlled airspace that is always around, uh, you know, the larger airports. Um, and so we have to plan, um, you know, if we have to get additional permissions from the airport to fly in that same area, uh, there's a little bit of planning that's done ahead of time. Um, you know, the, obviously the next biggest thing too outside of the airport um, is, is there going to be a lot of people that are nearby? Uh, and if that's the case, we may have to, uh, you know, take some additional security precautions just to make sure that, um, you know, that we're, we're not operating near the individuals. And of course, the final one, which is uh, everybody is, is we're held to this is uh, the weather's got to be good. Uh, you know, a lot of these drones, as sophisticated as they are, um, they are flying um, you know, electronic devices. And so snow and rain and wind uh, don't necessarily work well. <laughs> so we, we've got to make sure that we've got uh, decent weather conditions so that we can capture the shots that the client's looking for. Well, that makes 100% sense. Yeah. Yeah. With uh, the uh, use of drones being becoming more and more prevalent, and they are, of course, smaller machines than a helicopter, right? Yeah. Uh, so what, uh, do, do you have an idea, uh, and I think uh, we asserted this in the last episode without actually bringing up any actual numbers, but how much cheaper is it to uh, use a drone to get footage as opposed to uh, renting out a helicopter? Well, you look at, you know, the cost of helicopter, you know, on standby um, can range in the thousands of dollars on a day rate, um, let alone being in the year. Um, you know, you also have the carbon footprint that you, you need to take into consideration as well, right? You know, and, and then probably the other big one too is, is a helicopter will have a, a certain distance in terms of, you know, a safety factor that you have to take into consideration to stay away from, you know, people and, and even, you know, getting low to the ground. Whereas a drone, um, you know, it's, it's a very unobtrusive object. You know, it's got a high quality camera. Uh, you've got great flight time, so it allows you to get much, much closer to your subject, um, and it can be done very safely in a, you know, in a controlled environment. Um, and like I said, now that you see a lot of these drones that are equipped with uh, you know great sensors and you know 4K, 6K, 8K cameras are are starting to to be uh, easily identified with the use of drones. Um, you can get a couple of aftermarket drones that will actually lift. Uh, you know, an Alexa or a, or, or a Red. And, you know, from that standpoint, then you're going to get great, great footage um, at a very low altitude in close proximity. So there's definitely some advantages to, to that. Um, you know, another one, of course, is prop wash and just simply the noise. Uh, getting a helicopter too close to the ground, it's going to just kick up a lot of dust and stuff. Whereas I can get a drone, you know, five feet off the ground, and it's really not going to have an impact on whatever it is that I'm shooting. Oh, excellent. And you mentioned the the footage, the Oilers footage, uh, or the the footage for the Oilers Entertainment Group outside Rogers Place. And I was just thinking of that when you uh, talked about the, that and how I, when I first saw those, first started seeing those happen during Oilers games, I thought, man, that's really good footage. It must have been taken by a drone. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I've been working with them now for a couple of years. Um, I actually did some initial footage with them uh, as part of the construction of Rogers Place. Uh, and uh, they ended up putting out a documentary called um, uh, Building of an Icon. And it was a two-part series. The first part was the construction side of Rogers Place. And then the second part was actually the preparation for the home opening game, as well as, uh, you know, our first concerts and stuff like that. So uh, they brought me in to obviously give them the sexy shots of Rogers on the exterior but also I actually had the op opportunity to fly inside Rogers place as well. So I was able to fly all through the rink and through the, 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 uh, the opening area there as well as Ford hall and uh, the hall of fame room. So they got some pretty, pretty amazing footage from a very different perspective. And I, and the way that I fly my drone, you know, initially the viewer will go, Oh, that's a really neat shot. But then after they watch it for three or four seconds, they're always left with, how did they get that right? They, you know, they, they didn't realize that it was a, actually a drone that was capturing that footage. So, uh, you know, when they ask those questions, I know I've done my job. Perfect. That's really cool. So it's, it's, um, I guess an art form onto itself. You know, there's, there's a lot of amazing photographers and cinematographers, and there's a lot of amazing drone pilots that are out there that could fly circles around me. Uh, the, the, the challenge that you will find is someone that has both of those skills. Now, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm neither extremely strong or extremely weak in either of them. I've just managed to be able to combine 
both skills um, to be able to capture the shots that the client's looking for. That's really cool. I like that. Um, I, and actually, now I thought up three more questions. Sure. <laughs> Do we have time, Greg? <laughs> uh, I was just about to ask you that, Michelle. Uh, I'm <laughs> I'll, good. Okay, I'll ask them quickly. Um, the first question that just arose in my mind is, how does one actually rig a camera to a drone? Well, most of the drones, um, like most of the drones are what we call an RTF drone, ready to fly. So they actually have a camera uh, built into the drone. So depending on what you're looking for, um, you can get a very simple drone that has, you know, very minimal camera control on it. So it's, it's almost kind of like a point and shoot camera that, uh, you know, that you're going to, it's a consumer grade camera um, that doesn't have things like aperture control as, and shutter speed and so on and so forth. Uh, from, you know, from there, then it kind of just, it moves up. Uh, you'll end up getting a couple of high-end drones that still have uh, a camera that's a, an OEM, a fa you know, a factory camera attached to it. But, you know, you've got something, you know, as an example, as a Mavic Pro 2, um, you do have a, a one-inch sensor. You have the ability to control aperture, you know, shutter speed, all the rest of the things that you would find on a on a regular, you know, both point, you know, on a, a regular DSLR or a video camera. And then, of course, then you have kind of your higher end cameras that, um, uh, are, you know, also a factory camera, but interchangeable lenses and a larger sensor. And so you're, you're now at that point where you can get cinema grade um, footage, um, you know, even filming 4K at 60 frames a second. That's pretty, pretty standard or minimum standard that they're looking for. Uh, and then you go up to the what we call a heavy lift drone. So you'll basically have a drone with an empty gimbal on it, and the payload is whatever camera you want to put in there, so long as it's it's within the range of you know its maximum takeoff weight. Wow, that's cool. I'm just envisioning this drone like flying with a camera below it, and it, it feels very sci-fi and cool. <laughs> it's it's pretty it's pretty impressive to see, and in some cases, for those that have never seen it, it can almost be very intimidating because they don't know what they're looking at and what the drone is actually capable of doing. Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> You're like, what is this thing flying? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, okay, two questions left. Sure. What is the scoop in national parks? We were talking last episode. I had the impression that basically drones, unless you have sort of specific park permissions are pretty much a no-no but are there can filmmakers get in there and get footage or it can be very challenging we'll, we'll talk there's kind of two levels there's your provincial parks and then your there's your national parks uh, the provincial park let, let me back up both both of them do require some form of a permit uh, which is issued by them to be able to operate in their parks now at the provincial level um, flying a drone there is it's it's still a challenge to get the permit, but you it can be done. Um, I do know that uh, a lot of the provincial parks do want some form of recognition um, as a result of you know um, utilizing a drone within the parks. Now, if we move to the national park level, uh, I can tell you it's an extremely challenging process to get. Um, rarely do they issue permits for flying in the parks. So, you know, the long and short of it is basically is you're, you're not permitted to fly in a, in a national park with a drone. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yep. And that, okay. Yeah. That makes sense with what we talked about last time too. So thank you yep. for clarifying that. And now the most important, important question is what is a nautical mile? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, <laughs> nautical mile, it is just a form of measurement. Um, so basically you've got, uh, you've got a regular mile and you've got a nautical mile. Now, nautical mile is basically just a little bit, uh, a little bit bigger than, than a regular mile. So essentially like uh, a regular mile is 5,280 feet. A nautical mile is slightly bigger than that. Uh, so I'd, I'd have to sit down and actually do the conversion for you. But um, yeah, when we're talking nautical miles, that's what, uh, that's what they're referencing, you know, around, you know, flying around airports or heliports, right? So 1.8 mm -hmm. nautical miles or, uh, you know, three, uh, three nautical miles for, uh, for an airport that's registered. So that's basically just the term of measurement that we use in terms of making sure that we've kept a safe distance, uh, you know, when we're operating our drone, if we're not permitted to be in those areas. Okay. That is awesome. Thank you for clarifying that because no that was mystifying Greg and I last episode. Yes. <laughs> no, no problem. Can I ask one more question? Do we have of time? Of course you can. Absolutely. Yep. You bet. 
All right. I'm wondering, uh, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of stories and generally about AI and autonomous drones. Yep. Um, I just want to get uh, your thoughts just generally on autonomous drones because there's been some, again, uh, talk about, say, for example, Amazon using, and I know this was just a, an animation, but like a, a, a big blimp and then dropping these autonomous delivery drones and then they'd go around everywhere. And then it uh, brings to mind like Terminator and uh, that show Colony where you had killer drones and stuff like that. So yep. obviously that's sci-fi, but you know, we're talking, you know, AI here, right? When we're talking about uh, non-autonomous drones that they're able to make decisions on their own and, and uh, fly without a pilot, right? Yep. Um, so what are your general thoughts on that? So, you know, it's interesting that you brought that up because I know um, Alberta Primetime reached out to me almost five years ago and they asked me the same question about delivery drones. And the response that I gave to them back then was, uh, you know, we've got a couple of challenges. Number one, uh, Transport Canada does not have the framework in place for the legislation that governs the use of autonomous drones. That's true, yeah. Yeah. The second thing is, is, um, you know, let's just look at sharing airspace that has not been, um, I guess there, there hasn't been any framework around sharing airspace in Canada between drones as well as manned aircraft. Um, the third one, which is probably the biggest challenge that we have right now is flight times. Um, you know, uh, but most of these drones that are currently being used today are, you know, consisting of a lithium polymer battery. And of course, with that, um, you have a certain amount of flight time and a certain amount of uh, payload that a drone can actually carry. So, so with that restriction, then it makes it very challenging to, uh, you know, do a long-term delivery uh, of, a, of anything, you know, heavier than mail, for example. Um, so, you know, when you look at what Amazon and those guys are doing, they, they certainly are uh, doing a lot of research and development, and we've got a lot of prototypes that exist that, you know, around that. Um, but, you know, like I said, that was five years ago. So now we're five years. And I, I said to him, we're really not going to see anything until, you know, for at least 10 years. So we've, we're still probably five years away uh, before we will actually start to see anything from an autonomous perspective. Now, that said, one final piece to that is right within the Transport Canada uh, Canadian Aviation Regulations, uh, Part 9 pertaining to drones, as, is it's very clearly stated that we are not allowed any autonomous drones to mm -hmm. operate in Canadian airspace unless we actually have the ability to override that. Um, you know, there's fear that uh, by, you know, pressing the launch button and then now once you've launched it, you kind of just wait for it to do its thing and come back. We have to have a means of actually um, uh, intercepting that particular drone if there's an issue and then having a, a physical operator manually being able to take care of that. Because uh, at this point in time, autonomous drone flights are not permitted. Hmm. So in about five years time, then, then we can say that that will be the beginning of the end of humanity because of autonomous drones. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. The start of Skynet or something like that. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, I think that's uh, all the time we have. Um, Matt, where can listeners find you? I am on, uh, I'm very active on my Facebook account. Um, I, I use that account to share a lot of industry information. And then, of course, I, I'm also active on Twitter as well as my Instagram. And what is uh, your Twitter handle? Uh, Blackhawk UAV is my Twitter handle. And then my Instagram, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny because I will have to look it up. Is it also at Blackhawk UAV or uh, yes, something similar? Yeah, Blackhawk UAV. Sorry, is my Instagram as well. Okay, so that's Blackhawk UAV. Yeah, is Instagram. And then if you just search on Facebook, Blackhawk Aeronautical, um, I'm, like I said, very, very um, uh, active on both as, you know, sharing lots of industry information. And of course, uh, you know, sharing all of the, the fun activities and stories and photos of things that I've done over the last couple of years. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Matt. We've learned so much chatting with you and it's amazing the knowledge you have in this area. So thank you. <laughs> oh, my, my pleasure. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Awesome. Uh, Michelle, you want to wrap it up then? Sure. Yeah, that's great. So uh, please feel free to leave us feedback and rate us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. And where can listeners find us, Greg? Well, they can find us 
well, me in particular, my email, greg at legalcutpro.com and you, Michelle, michelle at legalpro, legalcutpro.com. And on Twitter, you can find me at Cyclaw, C-Y-C-L-A-W, the original cycling lawyer. And Michelle on Instagram at Michelle Molyneux. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone so much for listening today. I hope you enjoyed and we will chat with you soon. Bye-bye. Legal Cup Pro has been produced by Greg Pang and Michelle Molyneux. Excerpts of Just Say Go, Dr. Octavo, Mendicity Mix, courtesy of Dr. Octavo and Michelle Molyneux. This podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only. Nothing stated on it is to be construed as legal advice. The views expressed by the hosts of Legal Cup Pro and any guests are their own and do not represent the opinions of any organization or other person unless otherwise stated. Intro sound clip film projector countdown has been truncated from its original form and is copyright 2013 Ivan Gabovich used under Creative Commons BY3 license. Outro sound clip film projector reel runs out by Stefan021 is used under Creative Commons CC01.0 license. This podcast is copyright of Red Frame Law and is licensed to you under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial CC BYNC 4.0 license. For details of that license, visit creativecommons.org.